Heather, welcome, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us, uh, and congratulations on surviving the uh, Trump era. It wasn't easy, as you well know, um, but yes, we're here. We live to tell the tale. So, um, I, you know, obviously, uh, would it be a good time to look back on the Trump era? But let's not do that. Uh, let's look forward uh, to the the Joe Biden um, uh, presidency, and um, almost more to the point is uh, what's happening in the Senate right now. And this there's a um, there's a fascinating dynamic that's developing. Um, just an hour ago, Chuck Schumer announced that impeachments are uh, hearings are going to. Well, I should say that the trial. I don't know exactly when the exact uh, trial will take place, but we know that as the articles of impeachment show up at the Senate on Monday, as he announced this morning, that means that the the process starts to kick in. That means it's imminent and we're going to see it. I would imagine uh, the first um, uh, hearings within a week or so, uh, at least. Uh, and uh, I'm curious as to what you think is going on. Mitch McConnell wanted to punt uh, the trial after you know, privately saying he thought this was a good idea for Republicans. And um, and Chuck Schumer seems to have, I don't know, called his bluff. It's, it looks that way. It's funny because you and I had, uh, I think we actually talked about this, about Mitch's little trial balloon there. You know, I'm deeply offended by what happened. And, you know, he he and he just just a couple of days ago, he was saying he provoked the riot. I mean, he used the word provoke. And I, I don't think either one of us ever really believed that this was a sincere position on, on Mitch's part. It was a trial balloon put out there to see how much uh, resistance there was going to be to actually, you know, putting Donald Trump out to pasture. I don't doubt that that's what McConnell wants to do. That Donald Trump is a pain in the neck. It, he's not somebody that's really uh, on a personal level, somebody that Mitch McConnell wants to deal with, but you, they do want the energy and excitement and devotion of his followers, obviously. So they don't, they, whatever they do, they don't want to alienate them. So obviously he has spent, he, and I think I was listening to you earlier, he, it's exactly what you say. He saw what was happening to those house members, including Liz Cheney, who is royalty in the Republican Party and a member of the leadership in the House. And she made a bet that the smart move, I mean, I don't doubt that Liz Cheney's, you know, alleged, um, you know, personal integrity was not the issue. It was about her positioning herself for, for a presidential run, and which is what all of these people were doing, Holly Cruz, Liz Cheney in the House. She did that because she was making a bet that Donald Trump was going to be, um, you know, uh, somehow degraded by the time 2024 came along and she would be able to fit into this mode of, you know, I was the one who stood up to him. I'm the strong one. And of course, she's an incredible, um, you know, national security hawk. And her entire, you know, like her father, her entire shtick is going to be that, you know, he destroyed our reputation in the world, which he did, but not for the reason she will cite, and that we need to rebuild our, you know, our aggressive national security policy around the world. And she wanted, needed to be strong, right? So this was, I'm going to stand up to Donald Trump. Well, in, in uh, Wyoming, where she's from, they actually, the Republican Party there issued a censure motion, motion against her. Um, and they are coming down hard on her. Whether that lasts, I don't know. I mean, I've been surprised more people didn't make the bet that Cheney met, yep. you know, made. Because just following in lockstep like a bunch of, you know, brain dead lemmings as the Republican Party has been, it seems to me, isn't there some room to take the other side of that bet that somehow Trump is going to, you know, lose his, his potency over time and that maybe you'd be in a good position? But she seems to be pretty much the only one. Ben Sass is the one in the Senate, of course, who's done the same thing, um, made the, taken that same bet. So anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry to digress, but I think that, that McConnell sees what's happening, as you say, and realize that his best bet now is to just try and finesse this thing as much as possible, stick with Trump, you know, don't make it into any some any big fight. I think you get that sense from the Lindsey Graham um, uh, argument on Hannity last night that you also mentioned. He, you know, what he was saying was sort of, you know, look, this is the process argument. We don't want right. to talk about the what actually happened there. This is, you don't impeach her. 
president after they're gone and look he's gone now so now we're just whipping him for no good reason and they did they just want to finesse it i frankly was really pretty shocked that to hear just this morning that pelosi had said she's delivering it on monday and schumer said we're going i mean for whatever reasons they have which maybe you can explain to me what what their thoughts are beyond just that it's it's so it's recent in people's minds so you want to you know i, keep I think I think it is. Um, I mean, the, first off, the fact that it's sort of baffling to us as to why Pelosi and Schumer would have done the exact <laughs> right thing that they should do in this instance is sort of telling. But they're doing it because the offending event happened two weeks ago and uh, the impeachment was more recent. They understand that the further out you get, the more it feels like a process argument. Why are we impeaching this guy? He's been gone for a month. Why, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they're doing exactly what they should do. What, what and I and think- And you also it, can't underestimate the human element of it too. And the fact that they right. were the ones that were hiding and they were the ones that felt their li lives were under threat. I mean, that is definitely a factor here, even with Liz Cheney's calculations as well. I, I think that's I, I think that can't be uh, uh, overlooked as well. I think that's absolutely true. And and and, th and that there and, and maybe that is what's driving their their political calculation as well. But I think it's quite obvious you need to do it uh, as close to the offending event. So it's still in people's minds. Um, and what is I, I think also we, we need to take from this. I mean, you alluded to it is that um, if anybody had a question as to whose party this is. Uh, the Republican Party. It is clearly still Donald Trump's party. And, you know, Mitch McConnell, here's here's a little tip for folks. When you read something about what Mitch McConnell is thinking privately in the New York Times, as opposed to a right wing site, understand that he is putting a test balloon out there essentially for David Brooks or for that type of Republican to see if there's anybody going to rally around him. And I think what he found out was what, you know, we had talked about on the program yesterday, 75% of Republicans think that Donald Trump got more votes than Joe Biden in the election. I mean, according to some of the research that they've shown now, maybe the numbers are a little bit lower, but I mean, I don't know how off this research can be the, the Republican party, is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the Republican Party. Any illusions uh, um, aside from that, whether, you know, they have dispositions that are different or uh, their voters have decided who they are. And that's and, and that's the way they're going. But it plays into this notion, uh, Digby, as we, as we sort of pivot from the impeachment to the question of the filibuster, mm -hmm. uh, because this is in some respects, the whole kit and caboodle when it comes to uh, Joe Biden's presidency, it seems to me. I mean, he is, there have been some very good, um, uh, you know, date, we're on day three now, really, to the second full day. And there's been some good, um, you know, executive orders. Um, some of the, and some decent appointments, you know, the FCC appointment. I mean, these are, these are relevant. The, the firing of uh, the general counsel of uh, the national labor relations board, that's going to have a material impact on the, on the power of, of, of unions. And particularly like on a day when Instacart just fired the, um, their, uh, the, the people, all the people who voted for a union in their, uh, in their ranks. Um, but the, the Senate is where this is going to, to happen. And, Give me your sense of of like where we're at here in terms of the filibuster, or I, or, or I guess we could start with COVID relief, which seems to be dead on arrival. Immigration, which seems to be dead on arrival. The the sense of unity that uh, Joe Biden was asking for uh, two days ago doesn't seem like it's happening. Well, what's happened is is that the Republicans have done what you and I predicted, what anybody who's been watching them for years would predict, which is they were going to take unity and bash you know joe biden over the head with it by saying we're not unified you're not doing what we want you to do what you're not you're being mean to us so there's not going to be any unity look at you you failure i mean they did the same thing with with barack obama so the unity thing was always always i mean it's aspirational 
uh, it's Joe Biden's, you know, it's his mantra. It is, it is his brand in many ways, you know, empathy and unity and I, I feel your pain kind of thing. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, blame him for that, but I never for a moment thought that there was a chance that it would actually work. And there were people who thought, well, he's got friends in the Senate and yeah, whatever. We're talking about Mitch McConnell and Ted Cruz. That's the Senate now. And Tommy Tuberville, that's who we're dealing with in the Republican Senate. That's, you know, so Joe Biden never had a chance in that if he ever thought he did. And it appears that he basically is sending out an invitation. If you want to do bipartisanship, let's come up to the White House. We'll have lunch. We'll chat. We'll remember old times, whatever. But because he's done these executive orders and he did, you know, they're important, they're big. I mean, Keystone Pipeline, you know, stuff, DACA. I mean, these are serious issues and they're very much oriented to the left. And they were basically saying to the Republicans, you please, I'd love for you to join me rather than I'm looking for ways to join you if I can. So that's a, that's a, a big deal. Um, as for the filibuster, you know, it's pretty clear to me that they've drawn the line there and that McConnell, I mean, what he did was unprecedented this week. This thing where he said, I'm going to filibuster the organizing agreement and in, in basic, essentially saying that we're going to keep the, the committees in the hands of Republicans, basically, because you can't, do, you can't seat the Democrats that have just been elected, making it a 50-50 Senate and shifting the, uh, the, the uh, majority in the, in the committees. Um, that was a shot across the bow, a nuclear shot across the bow, saying we're not going to cooperate in any way. I mean, this is as basic as it gets, as performa. There's nothing about it that has ever been partisan before, particularly after they made an agreement. So he's saying this, you know, he's saying, look, I, I'm going to fight for the filibuster. I'm going to fight for it with everything I have. And here I am coming out just loaded for bear. And that's the way it's going to be. So I hope that the Democrats you know, get that and that they are prepared to do the same. This is where I worry because what, what, you know, you can't fight an asymmetric war with the same old tools. And that's essentially what this is. You've got a minority party that is determined to, to rule by minority. And in fact, they're developing more and more skill at doing that. They do it through, I mean, they've been doing it through the Trump years in various ways. You could, you know, they get elected in this way. They take advantage of the Senate. I mean, the Senate right now, 50-50, the Democrats won 41 million more votes to get that 50-50. I mean, that's not democracy, at least as I understood, at least not in any kind of comprehensible way, that this is ridiculous. So you, they're showing that they are willing to do whatever they need to do to maintain minority rule. And, you know, they know they've got to get through the next two years. And the only way they can do that, I think, Mitch McConnell, this is what he specializes in, is going to obstruct it every step of the way. And the Democrats have to realize that they just cannot afford to let that happen. Now, uh, our friend David Dayen had, uh, you know, was, uh, was tweeting about this, and he has uh, an alternate theory. And I think it's starting to make a little bit of sense that maybe Mitch McConnell, uh, by taking this uh, maximalist obstructing position so early on, Right. I mean, he's not playing the game of like, of course, we want to work with Joe Biden and et cetera, et cetera. And I think he realizes that he could get jammed up here because, look, people need we we uh, we have the highest number of of new unemployment claims again this week higher than we've had since they started taking records in 1967, uh, higher than uh, than during the Great Recession. And to the extent that there was any type of recovery in the fall or anything like that, that has all gone away. And um, it's undeniable. I mean, it's undeniable. And I think people also realize that, uh, that, that, that Biden needs this, uh, this help too in terms of like uh, fighting COVID. And it appears that maybe what Mitch McConnell is doing right now is basically saying, all right, fine. Uh, like challenging, really challenging Chuck Schumer to do the filibuster now, because once Chuck Schumer um, triggers the filibuster or, or eliminates it, in some way, he it lets a lot of Republicans off the hook in terms of making tough votes. 
And, and he has half a dozen members of his Republican caucus who are up for re-election. Uh, maybe I think uh, one uh, or, or two are, are resigning um, in places like, you know, Ron Johnson uh, is, is arguably in trouble in Wisconsin. Uh, Marco Rubio, arguably. Um, there are others. You got Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania who's, uh, you know, going to retire perhaps, uh, it looks like. And so uh, he met, McConnell may just say, like, you know what? I'm, I, I, you see what you can do. Joe Manchin's going to have to take all the tough votes. Yeah, yeah. Kristen Sinema is going to have to take the tough votes. Mark Kelly's going to have to take the uh, John Hickenlooper. Make them take the tough votes. And so that we can get the Senate back in, in two years and you're not going to do anything terribly uh, significant as far as we're concerned, really, anyways, with a one person majority in the form of the vice president. That could very well be his calculation. That, that is that is super smart and could very well be because it, that does let his people off the hook. They're no longer responsible for the outcome, basically, of anything. It, it, they can go whichever way. And maybe Mitch learned his lesson because, you know, he he had people like Cory Gardner in the last election. He had people like Martha McSally. They were dancing on the head of a pin, trying to deal in those purple states, and it didn't work out for them. So maybe he's trying to sort of help some of these people, like you mentioned. Now, it, when is Manchin up for re-election? Is it 2022? Because I honestly don't know. Um, I don't. I think he's actually 2024. 2024 if, because yeah. uh, the Swearingen primary was the um, 2018 was actually, year. Right. That oh, was. Um, okay. It was the same cycle as Ocasio Cortez when she first came in. Okay, so it was the it was the big blue wave cycle right. that we made it through. Well, that's interesting because from the ones that you just named, the 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 centrist caucus in the the Democratic Senate. Are all uh, none of them are up in 2022? At least I can't think of who that would be. So, you know, it's they will have to take the tough votes for sure. But I don't really think Mitch is even caring about that because what he's caring about is his own people, who are who are now in trouble, which is a defensive posture for for McConnell. That's a little bit unusual that he's thinking in terms of how to let his senators have room to grow because he's done everything in the past. His strategy has been to have to have the Republicans be a monolith in the Senate to absolutely, you know, they they just did not make a move without worry. Now, it's, you know, some of that had to do with Donald Trump and, and that may be a factor going forward for all these people too. Cause I think they're all looking at primaries from the right if they don't, you know, total right. Donald Trump line, which is going to be difficult for them in blue states or purple states or, or whatever. So that's very interesting. And, and, you know, of course, and I think you're absolutely right. And, and, and Dayan's right too. you know, Mitch is all about, you know, strategizing for power in the Senate. That's the only thing he really cares about. Absolutely. I don't think there's, I don't, he doesn't have a policy agenda. It just doesn't exist. He is purely a creature of, of power maintenance <laughs> of, you know, in, in finding a way to do that. And he barely lost it this time. I mean, it was very, you know, it was kind of a miracle to be honest that, that, you know, we won those two races in Georgia and did that, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that actually worked out for us. Thank, you know, heavens for Stacey Abrams and the rest of those grassroots um, people down in Georgia and Donald Trump too, who I think, you know, made a hash of that particular situation as well. But that's what McConnell is doing. And it's going to be very interesting to see how that works because we're going to see suddenly, and as you've pointed out in the past, you know, Joe Manchin's going to have a lot of power in the Democratic Party without the filibuster. Um, he's going to be the fulcrum around which all of this, this legislation, and Joe Manchin or any of the others in that position, they are the veto point now. And that's going to be very interesting to see what they do. I, it's interesting because, you know, um, my thinking has been up until this point that why wouldn't Joe Manchin want to be the fulcrum? But, you know, uh, from just my my uh, um, back when I was in high school and playing baseball, there's two types of people who, who you know, are playing out in the field. Uh, maybe this is more like junior high at that point where there's some people who are like, please don't hit the ball to me. <laughs> and some people are like, please hit the ball to me. And, and Joe Manchin could be one of those guys who are like, please don't hit the ball to me. You know, like he like he could be somebody who is like perfectly feels that he's most comfortable not being the guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and without the filibuster, 
he really becomes the guy. Uh, and like I say, you know, Kristen Cinema could also become um, uh, the guy and uh, uh, Mark Kelly could become the guy and Hickenlooper can become the guy. It may come down to the, you know, the four of them and maybe, uh, I don't know, one or two others saying like, do we agree that we're all the guys? Right. And so that like none of us stick out so that like we, you know, we vote as a block. Either the four or five of us always vote uh, with the Democrats or we don't. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's very hard to know what the calculations are with this. Uh, but I would say as of today, my sense is, and if you had asked me this a, a week ago, I would have said no way. But my sense is that we could see the filibuster reform within a week or two. And, and here's the other thing from Mitch McConnell's perspective, it occurs to me. McConnell already knows that he can't block judges, right? Because there's no filibuster for any of the judges right. now, whether it's federal or Supreme Court. So he doesn't care. About, you know, that's out the window. Um, he can't really stop confirmees, except for with this tactic he's doing right now, which is basically like holding the Senate hostage and saying, we're not going to do anything, um, more or less. And um, so he's thinking about that legislation and he's got to probably weigh in his mind, like how dramatic can things get? with Joe Manchin and Chris and Cinema and Mark Kelly and John Hickenlooper as the guys. I mean, there's others too, I would imagine, that he might perceive as being roadblocks to any type of real legislative, you know, going big. It remains to be seen if those people can be brought along, particularly during COVID, but it's, a, it's the downside for him versus the potential upside of protecting his people and picking up a Senate seat, one Senate seat, that's all he needs to pick up. Yeah. Um, in 2022, uh, I, I mean, if I was Mitch McConnell, I, I might take that too. Even if I cared about ideology, which like you say, I'm not sure how much he does. He um, does. 